Okay, so today we're going to look at more detailed comparisons of the Apple Silicon M1 chip in the Mac Mini, and then also a custom-built PC that I made that has AMD's new Zen 3 Ryzen 5600X. So a quick recap of the benchmarks and the testing methodology that I've used. So I covered all the details in a lengthy uh, video they've also made. It's a previous one in this playlist. You can check it out. Uh, but a quick summary is essentially to be able to test across Mac and PC, I looked at Geekbench uh, as well as Cinebench, and then there's also the GFX Bench 5, and I sort of did standardized tests across single thread, multi thread, and then graphics where you know applicable, both using uh, OpenCL, uh, the Geekbench allows you to do a cross platform, and then Metal uh, for both Geekbench and GFX on the Mac, and then Vulkan for. Geekbench and GFX on the PC. So we've sort of combined all those things and then I normalized it around the Apple M1 because this chip is you know relatively cheap for Apple to make. It uses low power. We're certainly going to see more and more of these things. So what I really want to emphasize is you know the M1 is really the new standard and you really want to see well how do I compare against the M1 because things are only going to get way more capable after this. And so that's so sort of the normalized results, and you can see the other devices, you know, percentage-wise are either faster or slower. And so a quick summary is we see that the M1, you know, is very impressive. It outperforms 2018 MacBook Pro handily, which is maybe the most surprising or impressive since that's a much more expensive machine. And so if you were to get a MacBook Air, it's now better than a 15-inch MacBook Pro that costs two and a half times as much. Um, but then when looking at desktop systems, like even an older iMac, we see it doesn't quite have the graphics capability, although the CPU is way more powerful. But against a modern PC with the Ryzen uh, 5 5600X, the Zen 3 architecture, you know, we see that performs quite well. And, and of course, a new graphics card obliterates the EB1. On the other hand, if you were to look at a thin, light device like the MacBook Air, we looked at the old 12 inch MacBook, we see that performance is so much slower. And so that the new M1 chip, you know, if you got it in a MacBook Air, is really just a huge upgrade. You're looking at 10 times the graphics performance and like six times the CPU performance from that older 12-inch MacBook. So as I've alluded to before, I really think the M1 is the new standard. It's really going to be what everything is benchmarked and compared to because of its low power drawn things, you know, Apple's only going to make way more powerful chips, which eventually then the industry will have to. So I'm actually working on an app that uses like the same benchmarks that I did and sort of blends together a couple of benchmarks to give you like a quick overview or ballpark estimate of how does your device compare with the M1. So you can go to mbench.app. I just have a a little website you can uh, drop an email uh, to let me know if you're interested and I'll be working on this app it'll be available in the App Store for both iOS and Mac devices and um, I'm, I'm just you know combining known databases of Geekbench scores, Cinebench scores, stuff like that and then I have my own little like kind of blend uh, to blend them together to give you a very quick overview and you can just very quickly see oh okay my device is you know faster in this way slower in this way or you know a lot slower or whatever and uh, yeah, so check that out and you can go to the website, sign up, and then the app will be available soon. So we know the M1 is a great mobile chip, but how does it compare to desktop chips? So I want to look just a little closer at desktop systems and then we're actually going to go even a, a deeper dive, just the M1 versus the Ryzen Zen 3. Uh, we're going to look at power consumption, sort of conclusions, like what does this all mean for the industry? So as a desktop computer, just, you know, it is what it is. The M1 is not as impressive. It's still very impressive, but you know, if you want that power and stuff, um, you know, you can find it in other ways, right? It still doesn't have quite the graphics of a three-year-old iMac, um, and compared to a modern gaming PC, it's only a third of the graphics. Uh, still, though, the power of the CPU is right up there with the Zen 3. Um, it, you know, it's just about the same in single thread. A little less multi-thread and, and this is using way less power and we're going to look at that in just a second. So if you need a good 
cheap computer. I mean, the Mac Mini is amazing. And because even, you know, this custom-built PC that I made myself, and I was going to work on that, it actually costs more. I mean, the parts cost far more. It was, uh, I think, twelve or 1400 So you're looking at almost twice the price compared to the $600 Mac Mini. Um, so it's pretty good value. And then we'll look at the power consumption and sort of what that means for the future. Okay, so just look at that difference in power consumption. So yeah, the Zen 3 is you know about as fast as the M1, and it's always actually you know a little faster. And of course, you go to 5900, it's you know much faster. But look at the power consumption. So at idle, uh, the PC is still using 34 watts, which is almost the maximum the M1 is actually rated at. Apple's specifications, it's rated at 39. But under actual testing and stuff, the load that the M1 is typically under in, like when you're doing Cinebench, you're doing benchmarks, you're playing a game, whatnot, it's, it's actually about 25, 25 watts at load on the M1. And you can see that is actually less than what the PC, just to like turn it on, to go to Windows and to idle. So yes, this slide explains everything about why the M1 is such a big deal. It's not so much what the M1 is doing like right now, but it's what it's doing with such little power and what that m could mean for the future. Now, but wait a minute, what about Zen 3 and the Ryzen 5600X? I mean, yes, it is also an impressive piece of silicon. And do I love my new computer? Yeah. And is the Ryzen 5600X a great processor? And, you know, is it probably a good one to buy if you want a gaming PC? Absolutely. You know, if you want a gaming computer, it's still better to go PC at this point. Uh, and the performance is great, and it's a huge, you know, improvement over the older Zen, and now even beating Intel. And so I think it also puts AMD in a really great spot. At the same time, even though it is, you know, the raw performance is better, the reason why it's just not quite as exciting as the M1 is because of this crazy power draw and what that could mean for the future. And so this really is going to change the whole industry because this gives Apple such a significant advantage that if other players don't compete, you know, they're just not going to be able to offer the same experiences. And one of the experiences we're going to talk about a little bit later, but that's really important about this, is VR. So you can already imagine the kind of headset that Apple can make where low power, you know, having it lightweight in your head is so crucial uh, in a VR headset that no one else is really going to be able to do. A couple more notes about these power figures. Um, yeah, when the PC with the Ryzen 5, you know, scales up, it's using 208 watts. A lot of that is from the graphics card. So the 5700 uses roughly 145 watts. The Ryzen 5 5600X specifically is just using about uh, 40 to 45 watts at load. And this is, you know, I had it at just about 100%. Um, even though that CPU is, you know, rated for 65 watts. So it's using about 45, which makes sense, just like the Apple, you know, M1 is using 25, even though it's rated at 39. Uh, and then the other factor, and you see this from the Ryzen Master Utility, is there is uh, just parts of the system, like the memory, the RAM, the motherboard, they use a bit of power as well, and they use about 16 watts. So you have the 45 of the CPU, 16 of the motherboard, 145 or so, uh, from the graphics card at maximum use, and that's how I got that 208 watt number. And the 450 that max rated, it's simply because I have a 450 watt power supply, you know, in this computer, and that's sort of a standard thing. So um, obviously, we're we're good. We're well under that limit. Uh, it should be noted the Mac Mini, even though it's rated at 39, uh, the power supply in that device is I think 150 watts. So obviously, it's super overkill, but they just kept. The old power supply that they were using. So in any case, right, the fact that, you know, the M1 at load, uh, you know, the performance is pretty, you know, it's about same CPU and, and a third graphics, uh, but, but that, the wattage you're using is actually less than what the Ryzen machine is idling at, and, and far less than when it's at load. So, if you compare that, it becomes really interesting because, so, okay, at load, the M1 is using 25 and the Ryzen machine is using, you know, we'll say 200. So that's eight times, eight times the power 
right? And yet the M1 is roughly on par CPU-wise and it's only a third graphics-wise. So you can just imagine if Apple starts ramping up the power and if things scale linearly, they're just going to outperform it by such a wide margin. And that's what everyone's waiting to see. Um, I'm not sure that everything will scale exactly linearly, but I think to a point it really will. And so there's really going to be some really amazing, uh, some beastly Macs that are coming out in the next years. And again, when you look at like other applications such as VR, this is going to have Apple a huge advantage that really no one else in the industry has. So just to drive this point home even further, I want to take uh, some other you know, power consumption comparisons that we can make. So we've already looked at, okay, the M1 versus the Ryzen 5 custom, you know, built PC that I made. I also, so I researched and I looked at, well, what is the power consumption of the new consoles, right? We have the Xbox Series X, the PS5, and the Series S. So the first thing you'll note is the Series X and the PS5 are almost identical, uh, with the Series X being a little bit more power efficient, it would seem. Um, the other thing, the uh, 300 watt, like max rate on the PS5, I couldn't find that information, so I just assumed it's probably somewhere the Series X is rated at 315. Sort of more importantly though, at load, they're using about 200 watts. And uh, this makes a lot of sense. It's about the same as what my custom PC is using. And actually I built this PC specifically to try to mimic a next generation console. So I'm pretty happy about that, um, that I kind of hit that mark. And what is interesting though, at idle, the PC is actually you know, more efficient by a pretty good amount. So both consoles have quite a bit of overhead in whatever their operating system or something else is going on, which somewhat surprised me because they should be more efficient because it's actually a system on a chip, right? It's one chip in the Xbox and the PlayStation and all the memories integrated, kind of like the Apple M1. Um, and that should give you power efficiency advantages. As where a traditional PC, the RAM is slots that you plug in, you know, the CPU is a slot and the graphics also go through the PCI bus and all that sort of thing. In any case, um, the PC does idle, you know, more efficiently. Now, finally, you know, I'm not looking at sleep. Obviously sleep is a whole other category. I'm not looking at that in any uh, of these because that also has to, a lot to do with software, you know, rather than, op than and there's just other optimizations. So this is, you know, idling with the menus and then using it. Finally, the Xbox Series S is interesting because, you know, it uses a good amount of less power. Of course, it's less powerful, though. Uh, and then finally, I actually threw in uh, just a good old light bulb to remind us of kind of some context of what this all means. So if remember, we used to have 60 watt light bulbs and they're incandescent bulbs. And the big thing with LEDs, what was so great is you had the same brightness of a 60 watt bulb. But for example, it only uses nine watts. Well, let's go back up to the Mac and think about this for a second. The Mac, just turning on your Mac and you know turn on the screen, having it idle, it's using less power than an LED bulb. That's crazy. So think about it. So the next time you have your smart bulb, or even not a smart bulb, but any LED bulb, and you have a Mac uh, Mini, and if you want to turn on the light bulb, or if you want to turn on your Mac Mini, that light bulb is actually using more power than the entire Mac Mini, you know, or M1 computer device, which I think is incredible. Now. When you're actually, you know, pushing the Mac to its limits, you're editing video, you're running stuff, you're at 25 watts. Okay, that's that's more. That's still that's only it's only about three LED light bulbs, uh, even to like push your Mac to the limit. And we're still less than half. If you have an old incandescent bulb, you're still at less than half of that. So think about you could have two Mac Minis running. I don't know, you know, server loads or CPU, you know, intensive stuff all day long. And those two Mac minis would be the same as just turning on one old school incandescent light bulb. That's insane, uh, right? And when you look at all the other computing devices, you see how insane that is because all the other devices, right, their idle state is more than the Mac mini at load. Um, and, and it's, you know, like half of a light bulb or something. But then when you actually want to use these devices and push them to their limits, they all go, you know, much, much more. So the Mac Mini is a really interesting thing because it's roughly performant uh, as a, you know, modern Ryzen uh, CPU, uh, but it has a third the graphics capability of, you know, the next-gen consoles or things like that. 
However, it's only using one eighth of the power of these things. And so what you could see if Apple, all Apple needs to do is multiply their graphics by three times and maybe that multiplies the power out, but we'll just say also by three times. In that case, the mini, you know, or the Apple whatever M1X device, it would use 75 watts, uh, you know, at load. And, and yet the performance, the, per the performance it would give you would be such of a gaming PC or a next-gen console, right? So 75 watts would give you like a PS5 or Xbox Series X performance. And yet we're using less, we'd be just under the Xbox Series S, right? So we're only 75 watts instead of 85. Uh, and yet we have, you know, way more, probably double the performance of that. So that's what you can, you know, really expect to see in the future. And I think is very exciting. Um, we'll see what kind of devices Apple makes. Um, and then of course, you know, finally I'll say one more time, you know, why does all this matter and who cares about power and all these things? Well, for desktops, maybe it's not as important, but think of where computing is going, you know? Yeah, there's mobile phones, but really the future of computing is in VR headsets, AR headsets. We know Apple is heavily invested in these things. And so really what the Apple M1 chip means, uh, it's kind of, I mean, it's not really the future of the Mac. It kind of is. Honestly, it's the future for Apple because it's the future for the next Apple computing devices, which are going to be headset devices. And so when you can have these super high performing and yet low heat, you know, low power usage, lightweight, you know, VR headsets or AR glasses for different use cases, that's going to be incredible. It's going to give Apple a huge competitive advantage, and it's really going to drive this next generation of computing, which is going to be wearable, and it's going to be VR and AR. Thanks for watching the video, and uh, if you like it, subscribe, and uh, let me know what you think in the comments below.